most people think they have a hundred years and it's it's all good, but the reality of the situation, it's it's horrible to say, but if this is the truth, is that the average lifespan is 76 years. It's 74 for men and 78 for women in the United States. Um, I'm not sure about Romania, but the, it, it varies slightly in different countries. But um, when we speak to people, they're always surprised about hearing this because they have this idea in their head that that midlife is 50, but midlife is actually <laughs> is actually 38. <laughs> so it's a you have less time than you think, and and I think that that. You know, I love that you brought that up because I, I think about that every day. And that's part of my gratitude practice is to be grateful for the time that I have because I never know when it's going to run out. Stay connected to gratitude. Hit the follow button right now and join thousands of listeners tuning in each week. We're the gratitude seekers. Come join us. Hi, Gratitude Seeker. Welcome to a new episode of the Gratitude Podcast. With us today, we have some uh, amazing people that uh, have been working their lives, all their lives to, to find out more about what makes us feel alive, that what makes us really happy and have studied uh, what actually makes us live a fulfilled life and there are a lot of things that um, these amazing people that i'm about to introduce to you have done in their lives to um, to share with the world to experience for themselves and uh, they're not the typical things that you would you would expect and uh, i think this makes them rich and we will talk about this in a bit welcome bridget and joe to the gratitude podcast thank you for having us thanks we're excited to be here yeah i'm really happy to have you here because i am a big believer in the power of experiences and um, it's usually the these experiences that make us most grateful we usually think about all kinds of things that we did uh or even things that we experience today but things that we did that we are grateful for um when we look back and when you, we think about the the week that has passed or uh the uh, the weekend or the month or the year or may maybe the decade we think about those experiences so let us know a little bit more about you about the the things that that you've done Sure, um, Bridget. Do you want to do you want to start off with a little backstory, or sure, or, yeah, uh, I can start off with uh, just a really quick backstory of where I'm from, and then and then we can converge on how we met and what we've done since then. So okay. I grew up in um, in kind of a small city in Michigan, in the United States, uh, called Flint, Michigan, and um, and I grew up just loving music. That was like the love of my life. Um, and I basically did, when I was a teenager, I did every single job that you can think of that was like on the way to the music industry. Like it's, it, it, even the really, really horrible ones, like picking up trash at concert venues and like getting coffee for people at, at radio stations and stuff like that. And I just like worked my butt off and trying to get to, into the music industry and kind of out of, out of Michigan. Um, as much as I love my family and friends there, I really had this like big dream of like moving to California ever since I was a kid. So I did all those jobs. I eventually got a job at uh, Universal Music Group when I was a teenager. And um, after the office shut down in Michigan, I ended up moving to LA. And uh, when I was there, in Los Angeles, um, I ended up seeing a video of a woman hearing for the first time. And it really inspired me to get into social enterprise. And I looked around to all of these companies that were giving back 
And there was companies like Tom's and Warby Parker that were like just starting around that time. But nobody was doing anything in music, which was like my big passion in life. And so I saw this video of a woman hearing and I thought, what if I could just like do that like one time? Like that would be such a huge dream come true. And, um, and so long story short, I met Joe around that time and we started a company that um, sells headphones and speakers and gives people hearing aids. But Joe can give you like a background on himself and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, that, that uh, I'll give you the, the quick Joe story. Um, when, I was, when I was a kid, right before I turned 18, um, something happened that was pretty impactful in my life. Um, I had come downstairs to go to school like I had, you know, hundreds of times before. Um, and I found my my father slumped over the kitchen table and he was like white as a sheet and sweating profusely. Um, so we, you know, called the the, the 911, called that the ambulance because we assumed he had a heart attack. Um, and he went to the hospital. And long story short, it wasn't a heart attack. He actually had um, cardiomyopathy, which is this scarring of the heart, um, and his heart was failing. And this was a very sudden, otherwise totally healthy, normal. Um, so he, there was no idea that this was coming. Um, so this kicked off like a two month nightmare experience for me and my family uh, where you know, we basically were watching my dad <clears throat> wither away um, on life support, waiting for a heart transplant. Um, and you know, while this happened, you know, we we're you know pacing the halls in this hospital, and I, I still remember it so vividly because we were we were as we were there. I just kept thinking, this is so wrong. So many people live like this. They're postponing their life. They're postponing their dreams. They're postponing their goals. For, for some future that might not exist because my dad definitely had that kind of life. He just worked a lot and I'm sure he was assuming he would retire and get to do all these things in the future, um, but he hadn't done really any of his goals and dreams at that point. Um, and again, of course, he, he was providing for his family, which is no small thing, but um, we were really fortunate. Um, my, my dad did get the transplant and he got a second chance at life to do all the things he wanted to do but while we were going through that moment leading up to that it gave me like this great gift of urgency it, it showed me that we're not guaranteed in you know, this amount of time um, because like what was going on with my dad maybe the health part wasn't avoidable but the part that was avoidable was all the regrets he would have had for not doing all of these things that he had wanted to do because he thought he'd have more time so that just set me on this journey where when my dad started off his bonus round as he affectionately liked to call his second chance at life i uh i started just trying to do all the things that i wanted to do in my life like right then though, like with with a real amount of urgency and like bridget you know um i i grew up in a blue collar family my parents met working on an assembly line making brake pads and uh you know we had a lot of financial instability so there wasn't a lot of uh inherent wealth opportunities so we i did every kind of odd job i could to try to give myself you know uh ex opportunities and ways to just kind of grow things from like you know moving furniture to pumping concrete to doing landscaping and construction just anything i could do and eventually that led me to the opportunity to um to start a company with a friend of mine and that company accidentally turned into a different company um but it was a really fun funny story it all starts from an experience we actually got this little warehouse and made some t-shirts to sell and we got the warehouse because we wanted to build a skateboard ramp because we thought it'd be fun to have that experience of skateboarding with you know, in this company and uh that turned into another friend asked if we could help him ship some clothing that he was making um and the long story short with this whole career trajectory is we wound up becoming a shipping company for other brands. So we wound up not even doing the apparel brand very long. Um, but, you know, it was a really inspiring time because uh, I was 
I was able to see like Bridget, um, other young people start companies that were helping people around the world and giving back in different ways. And I had always thought that, you know, philanthropy was some kind of um, walled garden full of people that were really rich that, you know, went to hundred uh, or thousand dollar a plate kind of, you know, charity events and tuxedos, which I, I never even had any, any idea how that world worked. So the idea of being able to do something in business was really appealing. Um, and then, you know, a decade went by of me doing this work where I didn't know how to start, didn't know what to do. And then my my father actually um, got sick a second time. And when that happened, that put everything back into focus again. That put everything into this very clear focus of what am I doing with my life now? And I decided I wanted to not you know, risk waiting any longer. I wanted to do something that had a positive impact in the world. And uh, so I left this company that I was lucky to to start. And that's when I met Bridget. Um, I started doing some charity and she heard about that. And we connected and uh, to kind of just continue the story that she started. When we connected, she showed me this video of this girl hearing for the first time. And I was like, this is, this is incredible. And she was like, I want to give hearing aids to people. And I was like, that's amazing. I love this. You know, I love music. I, I, the idea of people needing hearing is so powerful. And then she said, I, I, you know, we could make headphones and speakers because it's tied to music and we'll sell them and use them to give people hearing aids. And we can go on these you know, missions with a charity partner and help physically give people hearing aids ourselves. I was like, this is, yeah, that sounds absolutely brilliant. I love this. We high five, I'm not even kidding. We met um, up at a restaurant. We happened to live really close to each other in Los Angeles. Um, and we met there and went over all this. And afterwards we actually booked flights and flew to China, went to factories and made headphones. <laughs> it was just like that quickly. Um, and it was only about a year uh, it was about eight months actually later we were on the ground in peru giving people hearing and seeing someone here for the first time just like in that video um so i'll let bridget kind of tell that story because it's really powerful um but why don't you tell him this story about uh, maria bridget sure so it was just the craziest moment. One of the craziest moments of my life is just, you know, having like this dream, like this very far fetched thing, like, oh, I want to start a company that gives people hearing for the first time. Like, that's a very far fetched thing, at least for me at that time. And for us to like visualize that. And then like eight months later, we go to Peru. And the first day that we're there, um, you know, we didn't really know what we were doing. We were like learning throughout the day. And then one of our patients uh, came up with her parents and she, it was her 18th birthday. And like her, her wish for her birthday was to get hearing. Like she, all she wanted her whole life was that, but her family could never afford it. And so they took her like on a multiple day long journey to get to where we were. So she would have the chance at hearing and it was just like the most powerful moment ever. Like she sat down in this chair, we gave her hearing aids and it was just like in the video that we had seen where someone had this like life transformation happen like that, you know, within wow. like 10 seconds, you know, she's like completely can't hear. And then 10 seconds later, she's like, you know, that reaction of like hearing for the first time. And her mom was there, her dad was there and we were all like, crying <laughs> we were just like all sobbing together because it was not only was it like her dream come true but it was like our dream come true to see that and ever since that day that was in 2000 that was uh pretty much exactly like 10 years ago um we have given over 50,000 kids hearing for the first time so Amazing. not only did we get to see that first one, we've done that many, many, many times over that. And in addition, we've been able to travel to all these places throughout the world that most people don't get to see because a lot of the time it's in like our rural area. So it's just been the most incredible experience of, of our lives and, um, and just so powerful. So I'm very, I mean, speaking of gratitude, that's probably the thing I'm most grateful for in my entire life is just that whole experience.
Definitely. Uh, what I love about this, and uh, I'm sure that our listeners have been thinking about this too, like just the fact that you can hear my voice right now, it's it's something amazing. Like so many people don't get to hear uh, other people's voices. They don't get to experience all the tonalities, all the beautiful music, all of the beautiful sounds in the world. And thankfully, there are people like you, uh, Bridget and Joe, that are helping people have this experience. And I think this is this is amazing because you get to experience that that moment of uh, of joy, of uh, gratitude that that people feel when they hear for the first time, or they uh, get to hear better, right? Because I, I think there are situations in which they can hear a bit, but they can't hear well enough, right? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the number one disability in the world, which wow. it doesn't get like a lot of um, attention, I feel. Um, maybe that's just me, but <laughs> like when we started it, we were looking at all of these causes that got all these attention and they're all worthy, of course, but there was nobody doing anything in hearing and it's the number one disability. And it really holds people back, especially in a lot of these rural places where the kids can't go to school, they can't get jobs, they can't you know, grow into a, like a functioning, you know, adult in society. And, and it really does change their life like immediately. So it's, uh, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I can only imagine. And if you have any, so aside from, from this story from Peru for, from when you started, like, do you have uh, a story that really stuck with you? Um, like, someone hearing from for the first time and how they experienced the, the sounds how it made you feel of course because you you empathize with with them is there a particular story that you want to share i think joe you you have one in mind <laughs> yeah, you know, there's so many to be honest there's a lot but uh it, it, yeah, yeah there's so many times um but you know we learned it was such a, a growth experience and journey for us because there was so much that we learned along the way that we that, on to be totally honest we hadn't even thought of some of the things that were ha going to happen um you know one of those being that you know the the majority of uh patients we saw were, were kids but um there was still a lot of elderly people too as well that had lost their hearing um so that was really something that you know, obviously we understood that elderly people lose their hearing, but when you start to interact and have these these conversations with friends and family members, you realize all of the wisdom and knowledge and connectivity and, and memories that are lost because of that. So one of the things I remember that was really powerful was we there was there was someone that was a oh they were over a hundred and they said they hadn't been able to hear in 40 years. And they were there with their kids and their grandkids and their great grandkids. And after we got the hearing aids on, they started communicating. I remember talking to the granddaughter and she was like, we, we don't know any of the history of our family and all these things. And he hasn't been able to share that with us. And she was like, I'm so grateful. And they were just immediately, by the way, you know, having a conversation and he was laughing and he was really funny. He was cracking jokes like immediately, like he started just like, just like an old person that doesn't have a lot of cares in the world. He was being so funny. And we were just like, wow, we just reconnected generations, like generations wow. that were completely separated. And, and I'll, I'll throw another thing in that was really also interesting because we were so sure that music is just like this powerful emotional driver and connector and to your point about you know there's people that that right now aren't hearing what we're hearing um but they could so when we would go to missions we would play music immediately right after we got somebody hearing again we would immediately put some music on um and we were actually on this mission in china and we were trying to play some music for this this an older person and um he wasn't really responding to too much to the music and uh but we were pretty sure that you know he, he was hearing well 
but he just didn't seem to be emoting very much, I would say. And then uh, I, we asked one of the people that was volunteering there from China, he said, you know, what's, is there, can you give us some music that's a local music? Um, because we don't know the music from, we were in this place called Kunming, China. And uh, they said, oh yeah. And they got out some traditional music that they assured us this gentleman would probably know. And we played that and it was like night and day. And all of a sudden he lit up and just started bobbing his head and smiling and humming along. And we're like, oh, you know, so then, at, you know, we, we were very conscious of making sure we had local music for the different types of missions we did because different people are connected to different types of music. And that's really, I think the cool thing about, you know, the, the mission that we were on it was it was about music as a whole not like one type of music and hearing as a whole as in like the whole planet not one area so so that was something that was really powerful yeah that's that's wonderful i i think music is is so so powerful when when um we connect so many memories so many emotions to music and uh I, I like to do this as well, like with uh, my parents or my my girlfriend's parents. Uh, I want to uh, put their the music that they were listening to, because for their for them it's harder to access. For me, it's like really easy. I just search for it on YouTube or on Spotify or something, and I can uh, just um, give them this experience, and I can see how emotional it is for them, and. I can only imagine how it is for someone uh, in in a similar situation from from uh, some some points of view, n not hearing maybe for I don't know twenty or thirty years, and being able to hear the the, the songs that connect them to to certain experiences actually right uh, as well because we we tend to connect music to certain experiences as well and yeah it's. I can only imagine how much joy and gratitude you you are able to to witness and to experience yourselves. Absolutely. I mean, music has, is so interesting when you think about it with memory. Like there's actually a few really good books about that. But um, I just I love thinking about that. And I love seeing the elderly people when they would hear something from that came out in like the 60s or 70s and they're like, like just light up and like they would remember like they haven't heard that in so long but they still remember every single like word and i just think that's so powerful i know that uh you also um spent quite a few years interviewing social science experts conducting studies on life experiences what can you tell us about uh, some of the findings that you um that you got to? Sure. So um, the segue between, so in 2020, um, as you know, obviously the world shut down, but um, a lot of things happened in our lives in that year. And um, I went through like this huge mental health crisis and Joe had his first, uh, his first baby and, and COVID oh happened and I had moved to back to Los Angeles and, um, and our nonprofit partner, Starkey, the, the ones who gave the hearing aids, um, they actually had like temporarily shut down. Obviously we couldn't travel around the world and, you know, meet with thousands of people a day. <laughs> so, so we went through this whole transition period of like, what do we really want to do? Like what's important to us? If we can't travel and give hearing, you know, what are we going to do with our lives? And and we went around and asked a lot of people that we knew and that were close to us. And they were like, the one thing that you guys need to do is tell your stories and like help other people like have these types of experiences. And so we started, you know, asking people that were around us, like, well, what was the best experience of your life? And like, what's their, what is like your biggest regret? Or what would you still want to do if you had like more time or, you know, more money or like whatever, and kind of just seeing what people said. And it was like so interesting. And some of the answers were really sad because a lot of people will say things like, 
I always wanted to go to the next state over. And it's like, well, it's, it's only two hours away. <laughs> it's very possible. <laughs> but um, after we asked our friends and family those questions, we decided to go bigger with it. And we started a survey and we ended up getting over 20,000 responses around those same questions. And that's kind of what formed a lot of the basis of, uh, of the book that we started writing. So it's, it was a really, really cool experience just to ask. And a lot of the people that we asked were elderly. And I think that obviously, you know, they have the most wisdom and to ask an elderly person, like, what was the most impactful experience of your life? You know, they never said anything like, my bank account or my, you know, buying a watch or anything, anything like that. It was always something super heartfelt. Like, you know, when I took my wife on vacation to Italy or like something around an experience was like the number one answer. Um, so we, we kind of took all of those learnings and, and put them into the book. Hey, Gratitude Seeker. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this interview. I really appreciate it. And if you could think of one person that would also benefit from it, share it with them. It might actually be the inspiration that they need to make their day or maybe even their life much better. Thank you so much once again. This has been Georgian Benta. Don't forget to keep seeking and spreading gratitude.